Welcome to the 2021 Girl Day event at the University of Texas at Austin. We hope you're enjoying the event so far. We put this booth together as a message to budding scientists highlighting the contributions women have made to science, despite having many hurdles to overcome. Although both men and women have the same thirst for knowledge, women have not always been given the opportunities to explore the answers. In the past, women were expected to become good wives and mothers. They were not considered as smart as men. Women were restricted from receiving education, denied access to universities and a lab space, and had to work without pay and funding. The work would also go unpublished and they would not be recognized for their own findings. Throughout history, many women have fought against the social stereotypes to receive education, broken all the rules to have the career they wanted, and risked everything in the name of science. Despite their difficult life journeys, strong determination made them pioneers in every field of STEM. Through their work, they empowered women all around the world and made the world a better and equal place. Rachel Lignatowski, a New York Times bestselling author and illustrator, compiled the life journey and struggle of 50 such women scientists from different time periods in her book titled Women in Science. Many of them did not receive the recognition they deserved at the time and were forgotten. In this presentation, we will highlight the struggle and contributions of 20 role models among these 50 scientists. We hope the life stories of these role models will motivate us to make the best out of the opportunities we receive today and keep us determined to contribute to STEM fields. Maria Sibylla Mirian was an entomologist. She was born in Germany in 1647. During that time, there was limited understanding of insects and it was thought they were not worth the careful study. At a young age, Maria started collecting insects to study how they behaved. She was interested in butterflies, particularly the connection between caterpillars and butterflies. She published a book on metamorphosis filled with scientific notes and illustrations. Curious about new insects, she braved the rainforest in South America at age 52. She documented never before seen bugs and handled poisonous bugs in the rainforest. Unfortunately, her trip ended early when she contracted malaria. Her book, Metamorphosis of the Insects of Suriname, was a hit all over Europe. Her work helped future scientists to classify and understand insects. Mary Anning was a fossil collector and paleontologist. She was born in 1799 in a small English seaside town. Her family was poor, so she used to help her father collect fossils to sell to rich tourists. It was dangerous work. Despite this, 11-year-old Mary took over the fossil business when her father died. Mary helped to prove the existence and extinction of dinosaurs by discovering the relevant fossils. She also discovered many skeletons outside of Germany and many different ancient fossilized fish. Doctors and geologists respected her ideas and used her findings in their work. Despite her scientific accomplishments, her name would be edited out or never included to begin with because she was a woman. Her discoveries introduced us to the age of the reptiles. Nettie Stevens was a geneticist. She was born in 1861 in Vermont. She pinched pennies to pay for her education and often taught classes to pay her way. She received her PhD at age 41. The big question in genetics at that time was, what makes a baby a girl or a boy? For centuries, doctors thought sex was determined by what a woman ate during pregnancy or how warm she kept her body. Scientists suspected that there was more to it. Nettie got to work by dissecting bugs and looking at cells under a microscope. She found that, she found that male insects had an XY-shaped chromosome and female had an XX. She wrote about her findings with great scientific conviction, but unfortunately it was received by a skeptical public. Her untimely death has rendered her work largely overlooked and forgotten, but her work overturns hundreds of years of misconceptions. Mary Agnes Chase was a botanist and a suffragist. She was born in 1869 in Chicago. She started working after finishing school to help her family, but in her spare time, she enjoyed learning about botany. Her informal education also included working with botanist Reverend Ellsworth Jeremy Hill, he mentored Mary and in exchange, she illustrated plants for his papers. She got her part-time job at the Chicago Field Museum of Natural History and then became a full-time illustrator for the United States Department of Agriculture, USDA. There she took on the task of collecting and identifying grasses in North and South America. Even after becoming the senior botanist, unlike her male colleagues, she was denied funding to travel. But not content to just stay in the lab, she traveled all over the United States and South America, even if it meant paying her own way. Mary discovered thousands of new species of grasses from around the world and authored many books on these plants. A lot of today's food has also been informed by Mary's important research. She was also a suffragist. She protested for women's right to vote. 
she bravely participated in the 1918 hunger strike in which she was jailed and force fed. Her sacrifices helped gain women the right to vote in 1920. Lise Meitner was a physicist. She was born in 1878 in Vienna. After receiving her PhD, she went to work at the Chemistry Institute in Berlin. Even though she was brilliant, being a woman meant she was underpaid and not allowed to use the labs or even the bathrooms. Until government officially per permitted women to attend the university, she did all of her radiochemistry work in a dark basement. She collaborated with Otto Hahn throughout her career on discovering new elements by smashing neutrons against uranium. Her research was interrupted by the Nazis' rise to power. She had to leave Germany because she was Jewish. Otto and Lies continued the work by exchanging letters. From afar, Lies discovered nuclear fission, the reaction that releases nuclear energy. Lies was unable to return to Germany and Otto was awarded the 1944 Nobel Prize for their combined work without Lies. Although she did not win the Nobel Prize, Lees wrote papers on fission that were read all over the world and she, min she won many other awards. Alice Ball was a chemist. She was born in 1892 in Seattle. She became the first African-American and the first woman to graduate from the University of Hawaii. In the early 1900s, there was a public health emergency, leprosy. It causes numbness, skin lesions, leading to permanent deformities and damage to the nerves and eyes. Now we know that it's not very contagious, but back then police arrested the sick and isolated them. At that time, the only source of relief for leprosy was the sticky oil of the Chumugra's tree seeds, but it was impossible to mix the oil with water to make an injectable solution. The oil by itself was ineffective and painful to inject. At the age of 23, Alice developed a new way to treat these dense Chumugra oil. She found that after isolating the ethyl esters and its fatty acids, the oil could be blended with water for injection. This new treatment is known as the ball method, which prevented patients from forced exile. She died young at the age of 24 while teaching in a lab. Gertie Corey was a biochemist born in Prague in 1896. She knew from a very early age that she wanted to help people with medicine. She was a powerhouse in the lab known for her speed and her attention to detail. Along with her husband, Carl Corey, she worked to understand how the body uses energy. They solved the mystery of how cells use sugar for energy. They figured out how our bodies convert glucose into lactate and vice versa using our muscles and liver. This allows us to use energy when we exercise and store energy for later. This process is called the Cori cycle. In 1947, Gertie and Carl shared a Nobel Prize for their contributions to medicine. Barbara McClintock was a cider geneticist born in 1902 in Connecticut. She loved boxing, bike rides, and playing baseball. She didn't fit in with the girls. She started working in genetics at the University of Missouri. She was spunky and much more direct and intelligent than many of her male peers. The dean threatened to fire her if she ever got married or if her male research partner left the university. Barbara realized that they would never give a woman a full-time faculty position, so she quit the job. She started working at a research facility in New York. She was fascinated by corn kernels of different colors growing on the same plant and began to explore genetics. She discovered that different colored kernels have the same genes, but they are rearranged in a different order. This meant that a gene could jump to a different part of the chromosome and turn on and off. The discovery of jumping genes explains why there is so much variation in the world. No one believed her work, but she didn't mind. Almost 20 years later, the scientific community caught up with her and she finally received the recognition. She was awarded a Nobel Prize after 30 years after her initial discovery. Rita Levi Monteclini never let her circumstances keep her from science. She was born in 1909 in Italy to a well-to-do Jewish family. Her father expected her to become a proper lady and marry well, but she was determined to become a doctor. Though Rita graduated summa cum laude from medical school in 1936, she had no real job prospects. Italy was one of the Axis powers in World War II, and in 1938, anti-Semitic laws forbade Jewish people to practice medicine. But nothing could keep Rita from her dreams. She went on to eventually become a professor at the Washington University in St. Louis. She discovered nerve growth factor, NGF, a protein that regulates nerve growth and keeps our neurons healthy. In 1986, she received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. When asked if she was bitter about how the Italian government treated her during the war, she said, if I had not been discriminated against 
or had not suffered persecution, I never would have received the Nobel Prize. She went on to become a senator for life in the Italian government, where she fought for civic equality and promoted the sciences. Jane Cook Wright was born in 1919 into a family of famous doctors. Her grandmother was the first African-American to graduate from Yale's medical school, and her father founded Harlem Hospital's Cancer Research Foundation. She and her father changed cancer research forever. In the 1940s, when cancer was considered a death sentence, she innovated a less invasive way to precisely deliver chemotherapy using a catheter. This saved people from having whole organs removed during cancer treatment. She was nicknamed the mother of chemotherapy for her work. In a time where there were few African-American doctors and even fewer who were women, Jane became a leader in the field of oncology. She was an original co-founder of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, and the associate dean of the New York Medical College. She was also the first woman president of the New York Cancer Society. Jane Wright was not only an excellent doctor, but a trailblazer for women in medicine. Hertha Ayrton was born in 1854 in England. She was the type to live her life on her own terms. Her family was very poor, so at the age of 16, instead of pursuing her passion to go to university, she worked as a governess to send money home. Fortunately, she met with Madame Vidi Khan, a leader of the suffragist movement in the UK, who helped Hertha pay for her education. In the 1890s, flickering and hissing electric arcs were used for street lights and lighting in theaters. Hertha wanted to make something quieter. She invented a new rod that made a clean and quiet bright light. She burst open doors for women by getting published and giving lectures on electricity. Women were not allowed to speak at the Royal Society, but when her book Electric Arc was published, it became too successful to ignore and she was allowed to present her own paper. She was also a vocal advocate of the suffragist movement and provided aid to female protesters on hunger strikes. Edith Clark was born in Maryland in 1883. Both of her parents died before she turned 12. She used the money she inherited to pay for her college and became an electrical engineer. She became the first woman to graduate from MIT with a master's degree in electrical engineering. General Electric hired her to calculate and train other women. While working as a human calculator, she invented a new graphical calculator. She filed a patent, which became official in 1925. Now equations with hyperbolic functions could easily be solved. General Electric still wouldn't recognize her as an engineer, so the same year she, invent she invented a calculator, she quit. After one year, General Electric hired her again as the first official female electric engineer. She made it easy for engineers to manage large, complicated power systems. She also figured out how to get the most power possible out of transmission lines. Edith retired from General Electric and went on to teach at the University of Texas at Austin for 10 years as the first ever female electric engineering professor in the USA. She became the first female fellow of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. Hedy Lamarr is well known as an actress during the Hollywood's golden age, but she was also a genius inventor. She was born in 1914, Vienna, Austria. She has a secret workshop where she tinkered with inventions. During World War II, the National Inventors Council asked civilians to submit ideas. Hetty invented a problem she thought she could fix. The US Navy's radio guided torpedoes were an easy signal to jam. Together with George Antheil, she realized a radio signal could change frequencies using the same technology a piano player uses to change notes. The signal would be impossible to jam. Together, they developed the Frequency Hopping Spread Spectrum, FHSS. This technology was used to control torpedoes and communication during the Cuban Missile Crisis. FHSS is especially useful for communication between multiple electronic devices. It's a foundation for the technology that is being used with our smartphones, GPS, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth devices. Hetty won many awards for her invention. Hypatia was born in Alexandria, Egypt around 350 to 370 CE. She was one of the earliest recorded female mathematicians and one of Alexandria's first female teachers. Her father was a well-known scholar and he taught he taught her mathematics and astronomy. She went on to develop theories about the solar system. Her father also taught her to value Greek heritage and values. Her beliefs allowed her to shape philosophy teachings. 
People came from all over the country to hear her speak. But Egypt was a place where religious tensions between pagans, Christians, and Jews turned violent. Her pagan teachings eventually made her a target, and she was killed by a mob in 415 BC by extremist Christians. Her accomplishments in life inspired many, but her death turned into a legend. Her life became a symbol for education in the face of ignorance. Wang Zanyi was one of the greatest scholars in China during the Qing Dynasty in 1768. At the time, China had a strict feudal system. Education was available only for the wealthy and women were expected to cook, sew, and not to be bothered by studies. Wang Zanyi was fortunate enough to be born into a family of scholars who valued her education. She went on to become an astronomer, a poet, and a mathematician. She built her own theories about planetary mysteries in the solar system. She understood that the earth was round and described it as a ball. She also studied eclipses and published her work in a paper called The Dispute of the Procession of the Equinoxes. She studied the Chinese calendar system and used her telescope to update the count and placement of the stars and further explain solar system rotation. On top of all of that, she wrote about complicated arithmetic theories at age 24 and published a five volume guide for beginners. She only lived to age 29, but she is remembered as one of the greatest minds of the Qing dynasty. Emmy Noter was born in Germany in 1882. At the time, it was against the law in Germany for women to get higher education. So she would sit in the back of classes at the university to try to learn as much as she could while receiving no academic credit. For over two years, she audited classes until they finally admitted her as a student. At the University of Erlington, Emmy, learned, Emmy lectured unofficially in her father's classrooms and worked without pay or title. Albert Einstein's team recruited her to help further develop his general theory of relativity. Emmy worked for free for seven years at Göttingen until she finally started getting paid, but she was still the lowest paid professor. Despite the lack of recognition, she made new connections between energy and time and angular momentum. In doing so, she developed the Noether theory. She was fired from Göttingen for being Jewish during the rise of the Nazi regime, but continued to teach from her apartment in secret. After her death, Albert Einstein wrote in the New York Times that Amy Noether was the most significant mathematical genius thus far produced since a higher education of women began. Annie Easley was born in Alabama in 1933. Living in the South at that time meant being subjected to unfair Jim Crow laws that attempted to stop African Americans from voting. Annie used her smarts to teach others how to pass the ridiculous Jim Crow voting test. Throughout her life and career, she would always give back to her community. She also became one of the first rocket scientists in America. Anna began working at NACA, soon to become NASA's Lewis Research Center in 1955. After Russians launched Sputnik in 1957, NASA had all hands on deck working to get a rocket in space. During this time, she worked on one of the first ever computer programs to enable navigation in space. Annie's research on electric batteries, another focus of NASA's, laid the foundation for today's hybrid vehicles. Annie easily understood that being flexible, believing in yourself, and working hard can lead to amazing opportunities. Miriam Mirzakhani, born in 1977 in Iran, grew up reading every book she could find. She wanted to become a writer and didn't have much of an interest in math until high school when she got her hands on the interest questionnaire for an international math competition. Miriam struggled to solve the problem since spent days on a worksheet that should have taken her hours. Excited by this new challenge, she demanded that her all-girl high school provide the same math courses as the boys' school did. Miriam came to America for graduate school at Harvard. She was curious to understand the surface of a shape and what happens when it's distorted, and her work became fundamental in understanding curved shapes, shapes and surfaces. She won the Fields Medal for her contributions to mathematics and gave us a better understanding of the universe. Lillian Gilbert was born in 1878 in California. She wrote her PhD dissertation on the psychology of management. It was a first study of organizational psychology and how relations, relationships affect us at work. Together with her husband, they ran a consulting business. They would study simple tasks and break the motions down to the most essential steps to make the workers' jobs easier and quicker. They co-authored many books about motion and fatigue. 
Often only Frank's name would appear on their work because publishers thought a male author would appear more authoritative and credible. When her husband died, Lillian took sole charge of their company, but many of their clients did not want a woman telling them how to run their factories. So she decided to focus on homemakers. She applied ergonomics and motion studies to help make housewives' domestic jobs easier. She created new tools and a new layout for kitchens that cut work time down drastically. This gave women more time to pursue more stimulating interests. Her knowledge of ergonomics also helped disabled people find work. She designed many things that we use in our daily life, including the ergonomic layout of desk or the work triangle. Mammy Phipps Clark was born in 1917 in Arkansas. Racial segregation in the South meant that Mammy was not allowed in stores owned by white people and had to attend poorly funded segregated schools. Mammy got her PhD in psychology from Columbia University in 1943. She used her degree to change segregation laws in America. Her and her husband traveled the country and compared the responses of children in segregated and integrated schools using the doll test. They gave the children identical black and white dolls and asked, which doll do you want to play with? Is this doll pretty? Is this doll nice? It became clear that black children identified with the black doll and the children in segregated schools said the black doll was ugly and bad and thought they themselves were also bad. They used this evidence in the 1954 Supreme Court case Brown v. Board of Education to end segregation in public schools. Here's a list of some more women scientists that we didn't cover in this presentation. The task is for you to search and learn more about their findings and their life journeys if you wish. These women set a path to motivate more women over the years to increase their representation in every field of STEM. We hope these life stories will encourage you to be the next scientist. Please join and meet our representatives on the 27th of February from 12th to 4 p.m. to know more about women role models in science. We are open to discuss more about our experiences and provide resources and guidance for you towards the STEM field that interests you the most.